Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to Build. Uh, I'm your host, Ricky Kemley. Our next guest is one of my favorite actors working right now. You've seen him in uh, The Big Short, Not Fade Away, Overlord, and now you can see him in the beautiful new Kelly Reichardt film, First Cow, where he plays a loner on a fur trapping expedition in 19th century Oregon. Please welcome the great John Magaro. Let's hear it. Hey. Good to be back with you. Good to see you again, yes, John. Very How good. are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing great. Uh, I want to talk all about First Cow because I love this film. I love Kelly Reichardt's work. Um, and uh, when she succeeds, which she mostly does, it's a grand slam. It's just a moving experience. That it... Yeah, if anything, you can you, you can certainly say that she's a brave filmmaker. I mean, she takes a... She, she swings. She at yeah. least tries. So, but even being a, there are filmmakers who are brave and are try to be subtle, but they oftentimes don't build. They don't have all the blocks that end up building to the place that Kelly Reichardt seems to usually be able to get to with her movies. But first off, I want to ask you. You know, um, your breakthrough was probably not fade away, right? Would you say breakthrough? <laughs> breakthrough. I mean, that word is so tough to. I, I don't know if I've had a breakthrough quite yet. Right. If, according uh, to you. Yeah. That yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So it's hard to say. You know, I, I, I've always looked at my career more as a as the tortoise in, in a sense. Like it's like slow and steady. Maybe not by <laughs> like maybe like the tortoise, not by design. It just happens to be that's what I was handed. Um, you know, I had some some a lead role in like a, a horror film before that, the studio horror film before Which that. Which studio horror film? West one of Wes Craven's last films. Oh, called My Soul to Take. My Soul to Take. A little <laughs> scene. My Soul to Take. Um, My friend was the location manager on that movie. Actually, really, I don't know if I even remember location. half the crew. That was when Wes was kind of yeah. Well, he was you know yeah, that was towards the end. Yeah. Um, you know, Wes was, was great, and uh, he's you know we miss him. Uh, and then uh, yeah, not fade away was a, a kind of another chance to, to take a swing, and but it's it's always been slowly and progressively moving along and trying to find the next thing. But it seems like great directors seek you out, or do you seek out great directors to work? I, I, with? I don't think it's either. I don't think it's me seeking out great directors or them actively seeking me out. I think it just so happens that uh, you know a script will will be written and and by a miracle get produced mm -hmm. because I think any film being made is kind of a little miracle. Uh, and then just by 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 coincidence or, or maybe it's serendipitous, I don't know, we just end up together. Uh, you know, I, I believe that as an actor, as anyone who's creative, you, you sort of, there's an element of like the law of attraction where, I mean, it's just, it's just kind of common sense. You're going to have a connection and you're probably going to be a little better in your meeting and your audition if you actually connect with the material. And uh, I, I just have connected with these stories, so you know maybe that's part of it too. So talk to me about a meeting with Kelly Reichardt to be in this film. You are in every frame of this film, by and large, right? You and Orion Lee, uh, and yeah, and a lot of trees and the and cow, and you know, yeah. <laughs> yes, you share you share it with nature a fair amount. I just but. saw these articles that have just kind of started dropping on the services about uh, about the true star of the movie, the cow, which she is. I mean, <laughs> and I guess Kelly was saying. You know, like any movie poster, the most beautiful female gets on the poster, and Evie is our most beautiful <laughs> female, so there she is. Um, this came about, uh, it was kind of weird. Like, I, I got a, I got a, the script from my manager and agents. Uh, they were on the hunt, I think, for a cookie, and um, I worked with Scott Rudin a few times. We have a nice relationship. He's a wonderful producer. Um... I'd also worked with Todd Haynes on Carol, and Todd and, and Kelly have a very close relationship. Uh, and uh, I think my name got brought up, and, and, and Kelly was interested, but she wasn't quite sure, because if you look at a lot of the work I've done, it is not of this world. It's you know not a Western. It's, it's sometimes period, but it's not this necessarily this far back into history. Overlord was period, but Overlord's period that's was 40, kind of like you know, stylistic and and uh, yeah. And I live a lot in the films I do. I live a lot in in the forties or the twenties. You know, East Coast sort of that that world, uh, which which I guess my this mug lends itself to. Uh, but this, you know, she was she, she was intrigued, but wasn't quite sure. We sent her this short film I did uh, called The One-Armed Man that uh, great actor, director Tim Guinea put together. It's based on a Horton Foote 
short play of his set in East Texas, early 1900s, about, you know, the cotton mills down there, and this guy who loses an arm. Um, it's a similar kind of character, very introverted, very quiet, but much much more aggression underneath. Um, but I think after she saw that, she felt really, you know, confident about bringing me on board. We had a lovely Skype meeting, which is kind of how all that's done nowadays. Every feels like everything is Skype or, or FaceTime or, you know, stuff like that. There's that is such a huge leap of faith of me, in, in my opinion. I mean, even though your work, like, I think someone could see your work and just be like, this guy's great. But at the same time, just the Skype meeting and then, like, you show up to set? Kind of, yeah. A couple days, we were there a couple days before, and and we did this little boot camp type thing. Uh, but but yeah, it's trust. But you know what I will say? I I think the great directors out there, they know they know pretty soon. They don't need a lot of a lot of fluff and a lot of you know extra stuff to help them make up their mind. Um, they're pretty good at trusting their instincts. Uh, and I also think Kelly just didn't want to sit in an audition room for, for like t how many, God knows how many hours watching a million people come in and read the same lines. So you show up, I mean, I, I was reminded when I was watching this of your performance in the Richard Nelson play that I saw you in, which is uh, a play that I love by a playwright that I just think is one of the greats working, but similarly, very subtle, doing everything uh, aesthetically to make the audience lean in to hear yep. what's happening. Had Kelly seen that? Did you guys talk about that? No, that I, I, don't, I don't know if Kelly is even aware of Richard's work, but the word that Richard always uses is verisimilitude. And I think as a filmmaker, maybe Kelly is one of the most uh, uh, you know, successful directors at achieving that. Yeah. Um, it's a very similar style. Um, you know, I, I'm always striving for authenticity and honesty in the performance. Um, but the way that Kelly and Richard kind of go about it is, is almost supremely honest. It's, it's very strange. It's, it has a slower pace. It's really about listening and, 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 you know, finding the words that you're going to say. But a lot of that is just you have such great... Richard does it, she does it. You have great material to work with that you can kind of just let it wash over you and just just say it and be present it's really it's really freeing in a lot of ways but you don't rehearse at all really on a on, on a film like this right no, no i wouldn't say you rehearse you uh not many films that i've been a part of involve much rehearsal how do you find i mean because i've always i've always found actors upon first getting the script move quickly right there's uh it takes a little while to get to that place where they'll be willing to slow it down and, and, and really kind of discover things between the lines. Initially, it's like line, 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 line. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you have to have a, a, a trust and a confidence to, to, to do that. You know, you're sort of acting without a safety net, in a sense. You know, you're, you're a lot of the times in movies that we watch, popular film or traditional television and film, it's about pace and speed, and, and you don't want to ever have, like, a dead air, a dull moment. Um and I, you know, it makes sense. You want to keep people entertained and engaged. So it, it is a very bold move to, to sort of let the silences play and, and, and let the quiet live. But I also think that this sort of world lends itself to that. You know, you're in 1820. This is pre-technology, pre-internet, pre-everything, pre pre-radio, pre pre-everything, right? Uh I can't imagine that these people were constantly talking to each other. I have a feeling there was probably a lot of silence and a lot of silent moments and introspection uh, during that, that time. Ran out of things to talk about pretty quickly. I, like, I think did so. Did you read this article? Did you see this? I mean, we do it now. It's, it's We run out of things to say, and then we're like, okay, I'll just look at my phone for 20 minutes. I mean, it's, uh, How yeah. does she communicate to you when you get on set those silences or how to find that place as an, as an actor? Or is it in the script? Is it built in? Uh, uh, I, I, she, I don't think she ever really said, like, be silent, don't speak here. Uh... I think she just encourages you to live the situation and not try and rush or force anything, and uh, that's pretty much how it how it happens. 
in, even in moments where, I mean, is there just a sense of a, the tone of the film as soon as you start shooting where then you follow that guide? Because I think of a moment where Toby, Toby Jones, right? Is yeah. that the actor? Yeah, Toby Jones. Toby Jones, yeah, great where actor. you are feeding him the, the biscuit for the first time. And there's a sense of fear that we can see on your face because of where you're getting the milk. And you're also making, you're trying to please him by, by giving him this biscuit. But there is in no way an overplaying of that whatsoever. And it's as small and subtle as I think humanly possible as an actor. Yeah, I, I, I guess a lot of the times filmmakers and actors feel like they need to, to really hammer it over the head. Like, okay, now this is the moment. Like, is he going to know that this is his milk? Is this <laughs> yeah, like a yeah, like a cartoon? I mean, obviously, it doesn't become that, but like, but a lot of times we feel like a lot of times you feel like a lot of times filmmakers don't trust the audience. I would say uh, Kelly trusts her audience. She 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 has a tremendous respect for her audience, so she she never feels like you have to knock them over the head with every plot point and every. Uh, emotion or every every single thing that you're feeling she allows you as a viewer to interpret what's going on um uh as is richard nelson as a as a as a um playwright and as a director of theater um you know it's a, it's an exciting exciting way to work i find i find it very freeing and liberating you know you don't miss any sort of that sense of like being a new york city actor that's going to bring it out <laughs> Well, I, you know, I, I, there's a time and a place for that. Yeah. Um, even Overlord is a very, di that's much more like over the top comic book-esque type of thing. Uh, I like having variety. Um, it also depends on the type of character. You know, Tibbet and Overlord is this loud mouth, smart ass, aggressive, you know, guy. Uh, so that lends itself to being a little more overt. Whereas Cookie is, is not that at all. You know, Cookie is af afraid he wants to be as blank a slate as possible because he doesn't want to disturb the 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 you know the atmosphere around him. Um, Surrounded by men who are looking for a reason to be violent. Yeah, yeah. Which we see right from the first scene. <laughs> well, they're out. It's eighteen twenties. They're out in the North Pacific Northwest. No women. No food. It's they are mad. Terribly miserable and cold and muddy and gloomy. Um, so yeah, they're mad. They've been all, you know, they've been hiking for months at a time and they're aggressive. These are aggressive people who are violent and, and will kill you as soon as look at you. And Cookie does not belong in this world. So I think a lot of the times the people who are bullied, uh, will try and make themselves as small and, and unassuming as possible to avoid that, that aggressive gaze. Um, Sam, that's that that is cookie. One of the ag aggressors or one of the aggressive men is played, uh, if I remember correctly, by you and Bremner, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. What was it like working with? I mean, I know you and Bremner from Train Spotting. Watching Train Spotting. Yeah, man. Um, every great. day when I was like 15 years yeah, old. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's fantastic. That scene, the Spud scene, when he uh, has the rough, rough, uh, rough react. night. Yeah, rough night. And good, does a good, does a man good to get cut oh, loose every man. once in a while? Wow, wow. Uh, yeah, he is great. I, you know, another thing Kelly did in this world that she created is, you know, this is not the West as we know it on film where you have a dusty dirt road and uh, tumbleweeds, you know, going down the street. They're camps. These are camps. You know, this yeah. is proto-West. This is before, you know, it's before America is in the West. This is no man's land, basically. And you have people from Russia, from China, from the East Coast, from Mexico, from uh, and First Nation folks. And, you know, it's everything. It's everything. And uh, in doing that, I think Kelly tried to draw as as wide, you know, cast as wide a net for the the people who were in it, including, a, a, that you know, Ewan with an intense Scottish brogue who... Um, <laughs> is really, you know, intense in his role. He, I mean, he's sort of like the lackey for Toby Jones's character in a way. I always remember you and as well from uh, Mike Lee's Naked as well. Yeah, yeah. He, he's great. He's yeah. a fantastic actor. Uh, and Orion Lee, uh, Orion Lee, excuse me. Orion, Orion, Orion like Orion the constellation. Lee. Yeah, who was just here and I should remember his name. Uh, you guys had a boot camp prior to getting started. What was that What was that like? Yeah, I, you know, boot camp is probably the wrong word for it, but I, that's the only way I can... I think uh, 
explain it. I don't you know. It's so weird. It wasn't five miles in the morning. No, it was very. It was. It was more like a camping trip. Um, you, uh, ca- I, I, when when I was heading to Oregon to start shooting this, uh, I was talking to Kelly about Meeks because at that time Meeks was Meeks cut off was sort of my reference point. I. I I imagine that this was going to be kind of like Meeks. This has turned out to be very different. It's a much more personal, uh, uh, um, quieter even, uh, smaller story in a way. Um, so I sort of asked what, what they had done, if they had done anything, and she mentioned that they did a little frontier, like, like 1840s. There's like an actor, right? Who's like a performative frontier. Well, I don't know who did theirs. Oh, I but thought they, that. They Ron probably that. probably something like that. And they like did a little, perf- yeah, you, you probably know about it more than, than I do actually. But they did that. And, and I was like, well, can we do something similar to that? And she found a reenactor. Yeah, yes. Yeah. From Idaho who, who, who focuses on, you know, Lewis and Clark, early 1800s to the, you know, the Hudson Bay Company and the fur trapping companies who were out there. They took us out in the woods in outside of Portland, and we, we for, you know, he taught us how to forge, he taught us how to skin an animal, how to cook in that style. What did you skin? A muskrat, a oh, roadkill okay. muskrat. A roadkill muskrat. thing like- he ran over. It was disgusting. And then we ate it, and it was terrible. Gamey, I'd imagine. Oh, my God. Like it really was tough. god-awful. Yeah. I'd never eat that again. <laughs> and I was like, ugh. But then we also, you know, we did the, I did the cooking. I would cook stews and chicken and stuff for the, for the guys, and we made the clafouti and the, the, the oily cakes. And wow. Yeah, so it was nice. But, but more than anything, it was, it was a good way for Orion and I to get to know each other because we had never met before, and... We were about to embark on this sort of journey. And the movie doesn't shoot. You didn't shoot in sequence or anything, right? Oh, so you couldn't God. really build. I don't know. I don't know if I've ever shot a movie in sequence. You couldn't really build that relationship over the course. No. Like, yeah. I mean, we were a little lucky. I, I, as I recall, we started kind of with the beginning when he's arriving with the fur trappers and when he first meets Orion's character, but but then it kind of was all over the place from that point on. Yeah. The film is shot in uh, like a four three aspect yeah, ratio. Yeah, uh, it's beautiful. Um, Christopher Blavel, yeah, brilliant cinematographer. Yeah, he's amazing. He's he, absolutely. He shot. Uh, Don't worry, he won't get far on foot. The last fan Yeah, he, so he so he's film looks beautiful. He sort of is like you know I, I don't want, I, I might be speaking out of turn, but it seems like uh, Gus Van Zandt is sort of now using him more and more. Uh, Chris studied with Harris brilliant cinematographer yeah. who uh, who uh, worked with Gus as well. So I think they had a... Re- Gus and Fincher, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I think they had a relationship, and now Chris is shooting. But Chris is absolutely brilliant. I mean, this thing was shot on an Alexa, wow. and it looks like it's 16 millimeter because of the what they were able to do with it, with the lighting and with the post and, uh, and, and the aspect ratio, obviously. Um, Does that affect you at all as an actor? The aspect ratio? Do you know no, what they're no. shooting in or what the frame is going to be? Do you care? No, all? no, I, I prefer not to know. Okay. You know, if I, if it's something very specific, maybe I'll like be like, hey, where are you at? But but like, I don't need to know where you're cutting the sides off, really. Um, and I try not to know that. I I, I don't I don't want to really be thinking about that kind of stuff when mm-hmm. when it's when it's rolling yeah what are you thinking about when it's rolling like Just when lunches yeah. <laughs> when i'm gonna get to go home stuff like that yeah you know normal stuff i don't i don't you know. just want to be open to whatever the other person yeah doing, yeah so exactly. therefore you have to be thinking like a normal person you yeah think, if yeah. you think too hard about like what your character wants or what's happening oh i right? think You'd that's a terrible i think that's a, not to like listen i was there as a young actor i i i went to theater school and stuff like that and uh unfortunately i think you know, you learn a lot of stuff that you kind of have to throw away because it becomes far too analytical, and and you can't be, you, you can't tell a story if you're you're if you think you're in a classroom. When did you when did you learn that it had to get thrown away? You know, I had heard that from people even when I was in school. Um, I think we 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 um, we we sort of embraced that when we're studying and young more because like I, like I was saying before safety net it feels like a safety net it's almost like well if it doesn't work then i have the 
that to blame, kind of, because you feel like you have this this map almost. Um, or I can scream theory at people all the time. Yeah, yeah. Even yeah. though I'm not working, I can just yell about theory. Kind of, kind of. But but I I feel <laughs> like I don't believe that there is one style. I think every actor, as well as every director and writer and whatever, has to discover their own way they do it. Um, and 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 that's what it is. And I think as you you do more and more, you realize that because you're able to watch your work back. You're able to see what works, what doesn't work. And a lot of the time, at the end of the day, what works is you just being as present and just as relaxed and open as possible. Like knowing your lines and then hanging out and getting ready to work. Well, I mean, in a, like in a very like uh, a very. Um, I don't, know, I don't want to poo-poo what you just said, but like no, in a very like simplified way, yeah. yes. Um, but that, again, that very you know, I know actors who all day long are listening to music. I know people who are reading. I know people who are just pacing around, smoking you know two packs of cigarettes. Like you know, like everyone is everyone is different, um, and some people like to hang on to that kind of stuff too. Uh, it's it's really whatever it takes for you to get there. Uh, and uh, and and be present and and be there for your other actors and and director and you know. For you, uh, what it takes to get there and be present is that just sort of keeping it easy and keep staying relaxed. Um, I have like a big meal beforehand, yeah. and then I'll and, uh, no. I, I and um, if I fall asleep from the I meal, fall, I usually out. sleep, and then they go, John, John, act, act, and I'm like, okay, let's let's do this now. <laughs> no, I, I I don't. I don't know. It's, it's different. It's different for every job. It's hard, and, and I'd feel like a real. I'd, I, I'm too. Um, uh, so the process I'm too is insecure to, to say how I do it. The process is different for every job, right? Like you said that you eventually you discover your own process, but by and large, the process becomes different with each. In in a sense, in a sense, I think, uh, you know, you operate in in your well of how you do things, but but even in that, there's a spectrum of of you know, what, what tools you're going to use on that job as opposed to another job. Right, whereas something like the big short where you're showing up to set, you're going to get curveballs thrown at you the entire time you're on set, right? You're going to be improvising, expected to improvise, also doing the script. There's, what, six, seven cameras shooting at the same time, so you don't really know if you're going to be covered. Yeah, there's a few. Yeah, but A few, three? Two, we had two. I oh, think. two? That's Maybe it. we had three. I can't, yeah, it's a while ago. I can't really remember. Versus First, first, Cow, first Cow, which, which is, is one. one camera, pretty much going by the script, and you're, at, you're slowing everything down. Yeah, um... Yeah, it's hard. I I don't I don't know. Uh, it is different, but yeah, you like you said, uh, Big Short was a different film. I mean, I think if you if you have good instincts as an actor, and, and you watch film and you watch theater and you you appreciate it, you sort of have an idea going in. Yeah. You know, you sort of know the journey you're going to go on, and if you don't, and, and you're and you're smart about it, you, you get catch up. You you know get caught up pretty quickly. Um, uh, uh, yeah, but yeah, you kind of approach it in that way. This kind of goes back to my first question for you about working with so many great directors. Do you you clearly watch a lot of movies. You go to the theater a lot. You read plays. Like you actually. Care I mean, less and less now. The old, you're working. Well, yeah. I'm married, and you know, right. I have you know other things in life. Um, so it's it becomes harder and harder. Uh, it seems like for great directors, they can sort of have a shorthand with you fairly quickly. I, I think it's really vital for an actor to, to to be to learn as much as they possibly can, yeah, and to to constantly try to learn more. Um, one probably the most valuable thing I discover when I was at school because I grew up I grew up in Cleveland. I grew up not really around theater, but I knew I liked it. I did little plays here and there when I was younger. Um, and what school gave me an opportunity to do more than anything else was sit for four years and read every great play from, from the past and watch all those movies that I had, had missed, um, while I was watching just like, you know, the same movie over and over, comedy over and over again as a high school kid. Um, some kids, some, some students, some people are more fortunate that they get a head start on that. 
Uh, for me, I didn't. Mm -hmm. So it was really important for me to have those years to 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 form a foundation of knowledge. Um, but what was the comedy that you watched as a high school kid? Over? Back to the Future. Very. Uh, there that's was a like great a movie, I think I watched that movie when I was like ten or eleven, every day for a year. Mm. It was it was constant. Um, which is a great movie, but you got to watch other things, you know, you got to watch, uh, you got to, you know, and, and I think that helps because yeah, you know, if a director, if a director brings up somebody is like, oh, it's like a, the, the Bergman scene in Persona or like whatever, then you have a frame of reference. So that's, you know, it's good. It, it, it makes things, make things flow a little easier maybe. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I find it helpful. Other people might find that a, wa a waste, but I find it helpful. But I'm sure for the directors who are also absorbed in, in film culture and are cinephiles themselves, it helps them to work with you a little bit. Because at the very least, in between takes, they can talk to you about movies. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe. But some don't want to. Sometimes I don't want to talk. You know, you, you, you know, like any job, you're around, around these people all day long for months at a time. So... <laughs> After about two weeks, people start to like cut, and then everyone goes in their own little corner, like a boxing match or something. Um, it's just how we do it. Yeah. Uh, a couple questions from the audience. Uh, first one is by another Ricky. Hey. Hey, what's up, Ricky? Hey, John. I have two questions. I was wondering if the cow that was on set was just played by one cow, and if there were any crazy cow stories from set. Uh, yeah, we only had the budget for one cow, <laughs> um, so it was one cow, and. That cow would just come after a night of partying, and it would like come and just go crazy and be knocking things. No, she was very Constantly playing pranks on the actors. Yeah, she was praying. Yeah, pranks. She's more of a prankster than Clooney, I think. She was, <laughs> you know. Uh, no, she was lovely. She was just the sweetest cow. She um, she looked really like a Hindu cattle. She was as calm as they say a Hindu Hindu cow. She was just very easy going and had such a great energy and. The scenes I have, there's these scenes where I'm milking her and it's the dead of night and I'm just sort of talking to each other. And uh, I, I don't know, some, her energy was just really reassuring and, and comforting and uh, made it really great. And now she, I don't know if she's retired from acting, but, it, you know, we'll see if Hollywood starts calling. But she has a, a calf named Cookie. Uh -huh. The cutest little calf you'll ever see. Yeah. Was Cookie delivered after the movie was shot? Yeah, yeah. I don't believe she was pregnant while we were working. It might have been an insurance problem. Oh, okay. But she, she, um, she was great. She was great. Uh, one more question. Uh, this is from Josh. Hey, John. Hey, Josh. What's the difference between doing a film that takes place in more, more modern times, like Big Short or Umbrella Academy, versus something more period like this? The costumes and the production design. That's pretty much it. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not. I don't really, you know. Yes, you'll. You might. There, you, there's a maybe a cadence or a language or certain things that are that are different that you'll infuse into it. But but really, if it's a good film, uh, it's still people living their lives and 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 uh, and playing these situations. So really, it's about the clothes you're wearing, which help inform you sometimes, and and the space you're living in. Um, John, uh, I love First Cow. It comes out this Friday, right? Yeah, I think here in New York and L.A. it's this Friday, and then I think we'll start to roll out in other places over the next few weeks. Uh, and you know I love your work. I can't wait to see it's the next thing that you're in. always great to see you, Ricky. Yeah, good yeah. to see you. Yeah. We have any plays coming up or any 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 other work coming out soon? Uh, uh, I, many it? Saints in Newark, the Do Sopranos film. Oh, that's film. right. That will be out in the fall. Who do you play in that? I can't tell you. And, uh, and I just finished another gangster movie called Lansky. So, cool. yeah, we'll, 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 we'll see when those all... You know. Yeah, come back for Many Saints if you can. John sure. McGarr, everybody, let's hear it. 